The discipleship series, the five book series, are, are principles um, that I thought were really important to transmit uh, to somebody if you were taking someone from zero to maturity in Christ. What are the things they really need to know in order to walk successfully with the Lord? The f book one was really kind of a miniature systematic theology called Your Identity in Christ, just under understanding who, you, who God is, who you are, what is the nature of your salvation and the nature of your redemption and that whole, that whole journey. The second book was How to Hear from the Lord, um, because ultimately our objective in discipling people is to get them to a place. If I'm working with a young man uh, uh, who wants to grow in the Lord, my objective is to get him to a place in his relationship with the Lord where I become a peer, where he doesn't need me as a father in the Lord. He's walking on his own. That's it's the objective of parenting in general, right? You're going to take them and raise them up so that they're independent and strong, and you've transmitted the values they need to live successfully apart from you. And so in Christian maturity, that means that someone's able to hear from the Lord and will be obedient when they hear him speak. And so book two is about how to hear from the Lord. Book three um, is all about the principles of authority and submission. The, uh, the Bible uh, is not so much a book, and many of you already know this, it's really not so much a book as it is a library. It contains 66 books, and it's written by many, many different authors across a long span of time, and it, it contains categories of books. So some of the books in the Bible are straight theology, um, understanding who God is and how we relate to him. Some of them are just history. This is just what happened. Some of them have no real theological significance. They're poetry. The, you know, the Psalms, uh, Ecclesiastes, they're, they're poetic books. Um, and so, so um, when, when somebody comes along to criticize the Bible, uh, they'll often point to what they view as contradictions between this scripture and that scripture. And if you were going to take 66 books on any topic and put them together, you would expect to find differences in the way experts view different. I mean, I mean, it doesn't matter what the topic is. You couldn't get 16, you know, 66 books on biology that agreed, and that's science, you know. It's less remarkable to me that there are some things that are confusing from, but what's remarkable to me is the level of agreement that exists, the, le the level of congruity that exists across the entirety of Scripture. Um, wh one of the things we talk about in, in, uh, in doctrine is, uh, for instance, we talk about the scarlet thread. So this is the presence and the significance of blood that runs through the entire tapestry of Scripture. In every book, in every single book, we see the blood again and again recurring as a theme for life and redemption. It's remarkable how incredibly consistent it is across uh, the Pentateuch, the, the books of history, the major prophets, the minor prophets, the gospels, the letters of Paul. We just see the theme over and over and over again that life is in the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission from sins. And the, God sheds the blood of the, the, the spotless lamb of God for this. I mean, it's just an unbelievable congruence across this very disparate collection of books. Bearing in mind None of these men knew they were writing the Bible. They didn't know. You, you understand what I'm saying? You know, when, 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 uh, when David was writing the Psalms, he had no idea that decades and centuries later, people would grab his writings and put them in the middle of the Bible. He didn't know that. Paul was just writing a letter to the church at Corinth. He didn't know that, you know, 2,000 years later, we would be reading his letter as an authority. So, so nobody sat down and thought, you know, I need to make this line up with what Isaiah said. No, and that just wasn't in the thinking, but there is this beautiful congruence across Scripture. There's also something that you've probably heard less about that we talk about, this, the golden thread. This is the presence of money, wealth, and riches through Scripture. Um, in church, we don't talk about 
uh, sex and money. We like to pretend that we're disinterested in those topics. <laughs> but I've been around Christians my entire life. And I'll tell you, they are very interested in both of those topics <laughs> secretly. That's yeah, right, right, right. And, and we don't like them packaged together if we can avoid it. <laughs> but, and, and of course, uh, we, we, I do not subscribe as a church, we do not subscribe to the notion that God wants everybody to be rich or anything like that. This is not about prosperity as a fundamental. I don't believe prosperity was, was assured us in the cross. I don't think that was part of redemption. Um, but throughout Scripture, God has used money, riches, and wealth to propel the kingdom. And he's used people in the church and outside the church to fuel the building of his kingdom with money, riches, and wealth. And one of the criticisms Jesus had when he walked the earth, this is something that we've talked about as a leadership team, he said the, people, the children of darkness are more shrewd than are the children of light. That is to say that people in the world know how to handle money. They know how to leverage their wealth to accomplish their goals. And in church, we just throw money around like crazy. Like we don't, we don't use it strategically. So we're, we're going we're, we're to shift that paradigm. We're going to turn that on its head. As God gives us stewardship, we're going we're gonna to do things differently as a church that way. We're determined. But you see it across all of Scripture. You see it across all of Scripture. Um... And one of the things that I have seen over and over, this is something that the Lord opened up to me very early in my walk with him, is something that, uh, that I've called the purple thread through Scripture. That is, throughout Scripture, the significance of authority. In, on, on almost every page, in every major story of the Bible, you see God working through authority. And... Um, Tonight, we're going to start a study on the principles, the biblical principles of authority and submission. And um, this is a little different um, approach because this is, a, this is a study that builds principle upon principle. So here's this, there are going to be six of them, and they're not six independent. They're, we're like building... Uh, we're like building a pyramid. So this is the bottom level. If you get this one wrong... The rest of them aren't going to stand up. So this, this is the biggie. Principle number one is simply this. God has established the authorities in your life. God has established the authorities in your life. For many of you, maybe even for most of you, this book will be easy. You'll find it interesting. You'll go through it with no problem. No problem at all. However... For some of you, this book is going to be very, very hard. This is going to be very challenging for you. For some of you, the minute you heard what this book was about, you got nervous. You became reluctant. Um, you thought, here it comes. Um, those are the people for whom this book was written. I think there's good principles for everyone to know and to understand. I think the Word of God is good to know in all of its totality. But if there is an underlying authority problem, then this becomes of critical significance to you because there is nothing... Next slide, if you would, please. There are few things that will impede forward progress in your spiritual life like a problem with authority. It will grind your growth to a standstill. Now, here, I want you to listen to me very, very carefully, particularly if you're somebody who internally is getting a little mad right now. <laughs> and I'm not, I know it's a little humorous. I'm not trying to be funny. And uh, as I'll explain to you in a few minutes, I was one of those people. That's the reason this, is, this book is in the series. I'm describing myself to you. Um, but here's what you need to know. This is not a question of loving the Lord. You can love the Lord with your whole heart. You can want him to be the Lord of your life, and you can, you can get up every morning and say, Jesus, take the wheel. You, you could be Carrie Underwood herself. <laughs> if you distrust the authority figures in your life, 
your spiritual growth will stall. It will stop. Even if you love the Lord. Because the authority figures in your life, as we're going to see, are one of the primary mechanisms through which he works to conform you into the image of his son. Um, so it's, it's a deal breaker. Um, an authority problem can manifest a couple of different ways. The most obvious way is just a spirit of rebellion. You just, you know, no one's going to tell me what to do. You're not going to, you're not going to, you know, they just automatically come up against you. I think a lot of people don't accurately detect authority problems in their life because they're not rebellious. Here's the other way it can manifest. An authority problem will manifest in your life in your inability to trust. Now listen to me very carefully. If you are someone that has a baseline problem trusting, then almost every time it's a symptom of an authority problem. A fundamental problem trusting people is almost always a symptom of an underlying authority problem. And so, and so there are, I think there are people that go through life saying, well, listen, I'm not, a, there's this kind of famous joke about this kid that was, uh, he was a kid in class, and uh, Billy, he, he kept standing up in class, and the teacher said, Billy, sit down in your chair. And Billy sat down, and then a few minutes later, he got up, and she said, Billy, sit down in your chair. And a few minutes later, Billy got up, was dancing, and the teacher said, Billy, I'm not going to tell you again. You sit down in the chair. And Billy looked at her and said, okay, I'm going to sit down, but on the inside, I'm standing up. <laughs> and and that, that's what it looks like sometimes. It's, it's that, it's not this outward rebellion. You can be outward very, you can be very compliant outwardly. You can say, I'll go along with it, but internally you're resistant, or internally you don't trust. Internally you're waiting to see the plan fail because ultimately you're smarter than the person who's leading this, or whatever. I mean, so, so these can manifest in a number, different, uh, number of different ways. There was, a, uh, there was a season in my life when I was into training dogs. I'm, I'm kind of grateful that season is over. But I was working with a dog trainer one time who was talking about when you're going to pick out puppies from a litter, uh, how to determine which ones uh, are uh, predisposed to be the most trainable. Does anyone know this? Ah, well then you're about to, this will be very valuable to you if you go puppy shopping. So what you do is you take the puppies and gently roll them on their back. The puppies that will lay there with your hand on them, are naturally submissive. The ones that wriggle and bite and try to get out from under will be much more difficult to train because they are uh, just intrinsically not submissive. Now, I mean, even, even, even tough dogs can be trained. That was kind of, you know, this guy's whole thing was no bad dogs, you know. You must be calm and submissive. Um, psst, psst. I don't know if you guys remember the dog whisperer. Do you guys remember that? Um, <laughs> Uh, now, obviously, this particular test would be socially unacceptable to do to people in church. <laughs> but there are indicators. Let me give, me, let me give you a few. There are some, there are some things. You, you can just do the self-check on this. People who have underlying authority problems are continually inwardly critical of whatever leadership they are under. Whatever leadership they're under, they are inwardly critical of, and sometimes outwardly, although some, you know, we do learn to discipline ourselves to not always talk, but inwardly, they're continually saying, that's wrong, I know how to do this, I can do this better, he shouldn't be doing it this way, he should be doing it this way, and, and, uh, I am not at all saying, I mean, I, I, I very much encourage you to be people of discernment, to be continually thinking and assessing and evaluating. You don't blindly follow anybody. So it's not that any time you have that thought, that's a problem. But if you're someone who finds yourself in that disposition every time you're under leadership, right? 
every time you're inwardly critical. That could be an indicator of an underlying authority problem. These people tend to be nomadic. They don't stay in one job very long, a couple years. They don't stay in one church very long. Uh, they, they tend to, what happens is they come in, there's a honeymoon phase, and then they start to experience this person's leadership. They become inwardly critical, outwardly critical. It becomes hostile. Then they leave. Then God calls them somewhere else to another job or another church. And it's just a pattern of that because, they, you know, there, there is no authority that's going to meet their standards because ultimately it's not about that person. It's a baseline authority. They don't like any Buddy telling them what to do or exerting authority. It's, a, it's the puppy that's wiggling under your hand. It doesn't matter who it is. So you follow me? Um, you can tell these people because they immediately bow up when corrected. It, it, really, I think correction is the best barometer you can have of spiritual maturity in general. Uh, p people who can take correction, and by the way, it's not just spiritual, I think it's in any discipline professionally, uh, certainly as a performer, a great, great uh, attribute of a, of a seasoned performer is they take criticism well. Um, but people with a baseline authority problem don't like, be, like being criticized or being corrected, and they immediately become defensive in response to that. Um, and here's the thing. God has at his disposition all the time in the world. He's in no hurry. So if that's where you are, then he'll let you stay there. He'll just let you stay there and chafe under this leader and chafe under that leader. But, but ultimately what will happen is, and what, what I'm praying happens in the context of this teaching, that this will cross, cross over to someone who has experienced this in their life and they're spiritually frustrated and will say, wait a second, I need to reevaluate and reassess where I am and what's going on. If any of these things, if any of these things feel like a finger pointed in your direction, then I want to tell you, first of all, I'm not thinking about you, whoever you are. Uh, and um, this book is for you. And I would really challenge you to really wrestle through these concepts. And as you're discipling people, these are good questions to ask. And, and by the way, and I've been through this a few times now, you, you have this dialogue with someone across the table, across a cup of coffee, you'll find out right away. You'll find out right away. They're, they're either, uh, they either agree with this and they affirm this, or you'll, things will go very quiet. They'll get very, you know, and you can tell right away that you've wandered into dangerous territory, which tells you you need to linger there for a while. Lovingly, gently, of course, let the Holy Spirit do the work. And, you know, sometimes it takes people a while to process these things. So we don't, you know, the Lord's not in a hurry and we're not pushing people. We're not spiritual bullies. But I'm just telling you, it could be, and it could be that you're hearing this teaching and the Holy Spirit's got your number and this is the time. This is the season he's ready to confront this and slay this dragon in your life. Because some of you hearing this teaching, and I just want you to, I believe I'm speaking from the Holy Spirit here. Some of you, but for this issue, would be exploding spiritually. I mean, you have all the knowledge in the world. You, you, have, you really have an intimacy with the Lord, and you love Him, and you're gifted and capable, and the only thing you can't figure out is why you haven't been released. And for some of you, the answer is because you can't be trusted, because you can't come under authority. So He's just going to keep you right where you are and let you squirm from this to that to this to that and, and just be a nomad, be like Israel, just wandering around and never get released into the promised land because he can only release the people he can trust. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Um, I've told you guys that I uh, um, was raised in a very tough situation. My dad was uh, a Navy chief. He was a boot pusher in Great Lakes, Illinois, and he ran our house like he ran the barracks. I mean, we, that was just how he operated. We had white glove inspections, and uh, we would stand. I mean, it was, uh, and he had the same level of intimacy with his kids that he had with his boots. You know, we were, you know, and, uh, and then in the, in the midst of all that, we threw in alcohol. And so he was a binge drinker. So... On long weekends especially, there would be this, 
Is there a bug? Man, you gotta love how she handled that. That was awesome. Wow, that's impressive. Um, re really tough scenario. I remember, uh, the, the, and, and this was something the Lord took me back to as I, um, you know, I, I got saved in high school. And uh, you, you've heard me talk about Jack Birch, who came into my life to disciple me. And I was the toughest guy he ever did. I was the toughest guy he ever approached because I was so rebellious. Uh, I mean, when he first offered, this is a guy I don't even know. He took me, to, took me to breakfast and offered to mentor me. And I was insulted at the implication. Um, I, I remember the, the first time uh, recently that I heard the Hamilton soundtrack. And there's a moment in the Hamilton soundtrack when Washington refers to Hamilton as son. And he erupts and he says, don't call me son. And it stuck with me because I remember saying that to Jack. Jack. Jack at some point said, listen, son. I said, do not call me son. Um, I was insulted that he thought he had something I needed, that he wanted to put himself in some place of authority. And for the first two or three years of our relationship, it was as contentious as it was loving. I was continually exploding and erupting at this guy, and I didn't know why. I didn't know why. Um, and when I, when I left, I graduated high school, I went away to, I had one uh, semester of college. It was a great college career, that three months. <laughs> and... Um, I will always refer to that in my own mind as the time God called me away to confront me about my relationship with my father. And in, in the context of being alone and day after day after day after day of the Holy Spirit, he, he brought this recollection to mind. We were living in Great Lakes and I was probably six years old six or seven, I was probably in first grade, so, um, and our household was just, uh, just violent. It was just violent. Uh, I had uh, two speech impediments. I couldn't pronounce my ahs, and I had developed, and I think it was an emotional thing, I had developed a debilitating stutter, and um, my dad was embarrassed and angry at both. So he didn't want me talking when I was around him. And if I tried to tell a story at the table, he would, I remember him pounding the table and he'd say, shut your GD mouth until you know what you effing want to say. And so, you know, just, you, just, you just shut down, you just shut down. And I observed as a kid, my dad just brutalize my mom, my sister, and my brother. And, and I was on the receiving end of some of that, but I don't know, somehow it's easier when it's you. It's harder to watch when it's your mom or, you know. And so I had developed this coping mechanism. Um, my sister was in gymnastics, and she had, uh, she had these tights and, and uh, what do you call them? The, the leotards. The leotards, right, right, right. And um, I, I was a fan of the, uh, I was watching... Uh, after school, I would watch the Superman live-action series from the 60s. Um, you know, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive. And, uh, and I, at emotional level, identified with Clark Kent because he wore glasses. I had these Coke bottle glasses, and he was a guy that everyone thought was just normal, and he sort of got picked on, and his boss would, you know, and, and nobody knew that he was Superman. But then when nobody was around, he would take off his glasses and he would, you know, and, and he would open his shirt and there's the S and, he, you know, underneath it all, he was Superman. And somehow in my one-year-old mind, I thought, uh, well, that, that, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And so I stole a pair of my sister's leotards and I had a blue bathing suit <laughs> and I had a sweatshirt and I found a towel and a safety pin. And uh, when the defecation would hit the rotary oscillator in my house. <laughs> when there's screaming and yelling and plates flying off the wall. 
I would run into the bathroom, I'd shut the door, and I'd look in the mirror, and I'd jerk my glasses off, and everything went blurry because I couldn't see. <laughs> and un in, our, in our medicine closet, under the bottom shelf, was my Superman costume. And I would take off my clothes, and I'd put on my Superman costume, and I'd walk around, and I, I remember hearing the violence going on, and I would punch the air. And in my mind, I was beating up my dad, and I was saving my mom, I was rescuing them. And somehow, I just manufactured this fantasy world that kept me safe in a world that was crazy. One morning, one Saturday morning, I'm laying out watching TV, and with these big console TVs, and I would lay with my feet underneath and watch this big, and I was watching cartoons, and my sister comes running out of the downstairs bathroom, and she said, Dad, Dad, the toilet's overflowing. And Dad comes running down the stairs, and I immediately became horrified because my Superman costume was on the floor up under the closet. And just a few minutes later, my dad, with my brother in behind him, comes out holding my costume. And he looks at me and he says, what is this? And I couldn't speak and tears are welling up in my eyes and he says, is my son wearing leotards now? Is my son wearing tights now? My son? And he started laughing and Wendell started laughing and I was crying and trying not to cry and he's crying about it, they laughed. And I thought to myself, this was a seminal moment. I will never put myself in a position where someone can laugh at me like this again. I, I mean, this is, this is a six-year-old, seven-year-old, I will never cry again, and I will never give someone this power. I will never. And it, it, I'm, I'm telling you, as best I can recall, I kept that vow until the Lord came into my life. And it was this semester away that the dam broke for the first time and I allowed myself to cry and he took me back to that place and I realized that all of my resistance to Jack and all of my rebellion against authority was really the fact that I had made a vow as a kid that I would never trust authority again because it had been so, and it had corrupted every relationship I had been in. I couldn't keep a job, I couldn't keep a girlfriend, I couldn't, uh, I, you know, I was constantly in conflict and uh, d just couldn't manage relationships. And that, that was the beginning of a journey for me where the Lord began to unspool that pain and teach me the beauty of submission, the beauty of trusting, and that ultimately, I had made probably the right move for a kid in an alcoholic home. Protect yourself. Because no man is worthy of my trust or my submission. But do you know who is? The Lord. The Lord is worthy. The, the Lord is faithful. The Lord, listen, and if you're hearing this and something inside, I, want just, I just want to tell you, the Lord will protect you. The Lord can do so much better for you than what you think you're doing yourself by keeping people at an arm's distance, by resisting. Here's what Romans chapter 13 says. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities, as if the first sentence wasn't clear enough, he just summarizes again, the authorities that exist have been established by God. We, we could just stop there. I mean, it could, just couldn't be clearer. And this isn't just one. I mean, you're, you're going to see as we go through the book, there are just dozens and dozens of verses that reinforce this principle. The authorities that exist in your life have been established by God. They, they really have. Verse 2. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. 
And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Number three, for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one who's in authority? And do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They're God's servants, his agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Verse 5, therefore it is necessary to submit to the authority. He just won't stop. He just keeps going and going. It's necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of a possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, where the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. God has established the authorities in your life to resist them is to resist God. To distrust them is to distrust God. And if inside that creates conflict for you, if inside you're going, well, no, it's not, it's in, then you need to just meditate on this. You don't have to agree with me, but you, you really need to meditate on this. I, th I think the Lord might be trying to speak to you. You know, there are some biblical passages that are really obtuse and difficult to understand. I wish this were one of them. This one is just crystal, crystal clear. Uh, and it makes no allowances at all. It really doesn't. Um, so what if the authorities in my life are stupid? They're established by God. What if the authorities in my life don't know God? What if they don't like him or even honor him or even acknowledge his existence? The authorities in my life are established by God. What if the authority in my life occasionally gets drunk and beats me? I, I don't understand all that. But I can tell you today, God gave me to that dad. He, he didn't love it. He didn't, he didn't make my dad do that. He wasn't okay with it. And listen, if you're, if you're the victim of abuse, God's not okay with that. And, and I don't encourage you to stay with that if you're in an abusive marriage or in, a, in any other situation. I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the authorities, I'm just saying what the Bible is saying, the authorities in your life are established by God. Uh, what if the authorities in your life are just incompetent? What if there's just no good at what they do? What if you do actually in reality know better? These authorities in your life are established by God. It Say again? <laughs> it pertains to politicians? Of course it does. Of course it does. That's the reason we, we have no alternative but to, to pray for our president and our vice president and the leaders of both houses, whatever their party. And, and why we said from the beginning here, uh, listen, you know, for, for our leadership team, uh, being publicly insulting of a government leader is a, is a fireable offense. We just don't do it here. We just don't do it. There's no space for it. That, that, and, and you will never find me using my position as a pastor to leverage a political position. Even though I'm a very political guy, I follow politics all the time, I'm very aware of what's going on, I'm very active, and believe it or not, I have opinions on it. But that's not what this desk is for. I, I cheapen this when I do that. And I, I just don't want and, to... And I also limit my audience. You know what I mean? If, if I said, you know, I think... Joe Biden's the greatest president, then I've got, ha you know, half of the room who won't hear anything else I say. And if I, you know what I'm saying? Either way you go, you're, you're just going to, so, but the, the, the fundamental premise is we went into this last election. Jennifer and I had lots of discussion. We watched lots of TV. We, were, we shared lots of articles back and forth. We prayed and, and we were prepared with whatever we woke up with the morning after the election, that that was the hand of God, and we were going to pray for that leader. We, we did the same thing with the gubernatorial race. You know, we, we Terry McAuliffe uh, versus the man who is our governor now, and we had strong opinions about what we thought the Lord wanted to do, but if Terry McAuliffe had won, then he's the one we would be praying for today. No, no questions about it, because the authorities that exist are established by God. What if the authority in my life is making terrible decisions and the impact on me is really negative? 
What if I just don't like it? The authorities in your life were established by God. And, and here's good news. Proverbs 21.1 says this. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. So the Lord's capable of altering the heart of any leader at his will. And we have tons of examples in Scripture of him doing that. So if you're under oppressive leadership at work or incompetent leadership at work, I encourage you, first of all, that you honor them both in your heart and with your mouth. You shouldn't be running down the leaders in your life ever, ever, ever. You pray for them. And then in your private time with the Lord, ask him to move them. God, relieve me of this oppressive leadership. Relieve this organization of this horrible manager. Uh, I, there's just so many testimonies of God doing that. He, he can do it. He can absolutely do it. Um, God can change their heart. God can move you. If neither of those things are happening, then God must want you there for now under that leadership. And if you're not careful, I'm going to close with this. If you're not careful, you will miss what God has for you because you're so busy resisting it. Let me give you a quick example of this, and, and I'll close with this. So, you guys know the story of how we ended up here at this facility, Seventh Day, and it's been such a blessing, and this church is awesome, and their pastor is awesome, and, and, uh, and we, I felt, early, you know, really from the first time this occurred to me in the middle of the night that this was supposed to happen, that we were supposed to be here in this building tonight. I just felt it in my bones, and we kept, we stuck with it, and, and um, so we wound up here. And when they finally agreed, it was like, yes, we have a place, and I didn't miss the Lord, and yeah, you know, because I thought, well, I thought I just missed it. I just thought I'd gotten it wrong. And it turns out, you know, it's always encouraging when you didn't miss it, so that's great. And so, uh, so they sent us the lease, and I forwarded the lease to our leadership team, and everybody looked at it. We all said, that's great. And so I came and I had a meeting with their team, and we signed it, and they signed it, and they said, oh, one thing. <laughs> the first Sunday of every month is a problem. And, and we had just signed a lease that gave us the building every Sunday. I mean, we, the ink wasn't even dry. It was like, by the way. <laughs> Right? Um, and the deal was they had an older ladies' Bible study that meets in a fellowship hall on the first Sunday of every month. And the church, the, the congregation, was a little reluctant. You've heard the story. They'd had some bad experiences, and so they got them to agree. But they were saying, if you guys could accommodate them, it would be helpful in this whole thing. And I was, well, what does accommodate them mean? Well, if you could maybe not use the fellowship hall that week. And I was like, well, that's children's church. We can't. Well, could you use, just keep the kids with you and have it, just keep it quiet in the hallway? No, we can't keep kids quiet. We don't, there's no way to do that. I mean, we're just going to frustrate them. And they were like, well, would you be willing to meet on Saturday nights or Sunday nights on that first week? And, and I'm internally, of course, getting frustrated because this was all locked up and we had it all agreed and but I, I, Joe and I talked just uh, that morning. We'd had breakfast, and, and I'd said to him, the words had just come out of my mouth just a couple of hours before. Now, by signing this, we are in some measure coming under them spiritually. We're using their building. And so we're going to have to pray for them like we would for our leaders. We're going to have to serve them. We're going to have to, that sort of thing. And those words are ringing in my ears, as this guy says, if you could... And so I just decided, because what I wanted to say was, can we just turn to page four of the thing we just signed <laughs> and just read this together? But they were being so nice about it, and they weren't insisting. They were just asking for an accommodation. And I decided that I wouldn't act on my internal frustration or assert my rights at that point. And I came home, and I told Jen, and I said, it's possible that this is the Lord. It's not what I want. You know, nobody does a church where you say, you know, you can't meet 12 Sundays a year. Uh, 
and I'm afraid this is going to look like I negotiated a bad deal, and that, you know, but maybe this, maybe this is the Lord. Maybe this is the Lord. And as I prayed about it, I just began to feel like we should make this accommodation, we should submit to them in a spirit of humility. So I came back to them and said, we just won't meet on Sundays. And so when I presented it to all of you, you guys didn't know any better, and you were like, well, that's weird, but okay. And what we've been saying all along is that we don't want this to be a Sunday morning church. We want this to be built on discipleship and relationships, and we want Sundays to be a celebration, not the central focus. And in a way, this sort of helped reinforce that. And so we launched last October not doing first Sundays. And it has turned out to be an incredible blessing. All of our ministry team agrees it's great to have a reset, to have a week when you don't have to do something. It gives our people a Sunday, and, and I know every Sunday we have people show up, every first Sunday there are people that show up and there's no church, and they get disappointed and leave. And to that I say, gosh, I hate that for them, but I'm not trying to build a big church. So if they're frustrated, if, they, if God's calling them, they'll come back. And if they're frustrated, then they, they, there are lots of churches that meet on the first Sundays. Lot, lots to go around. I'm not feeling any urgency about that. And, um, but we tell our people, hey, you can spend the day with your family. You can visit some other churches. And I love that because some of you visit other churches and you give me reports. Hey, here's what we experienced. You send me pictures and video, and that's great. That's great. You get to see what other churches are doing, and you hear about those things. And Jennifer and I were able to run a race or two because those happen on Sunday mornings, and it's just turned out to be great. And so then last month, Jorge calls me and says, I have, I have good news for you, brother. The board has met. You can now have first Sundays. We are moving that Bible study. And I said, we don't want it. We don't want first Sundays. And I think it's entirely, I'm not declaring this. I'm just saying I think it's entirely possible that wherever we go, whatever we do, the tapestry will never have first Sundays. I just think it's healthy. I th I'm loving life. And so last week, I was in a situation, I'm talking to a guy who's a musician in the area, and he's like, hey, I heard about your church. Tell me what's going on. And I was telling him about it. He's like, yeah, I'm going I'm to have to come visit. Like, uh, maybe I'll come this Sunday. And I said, oh, you can't come this Sunday. He's like, why is that? I said, because uh, we don't meet on the first Sundays of the month. And he said, why? And my standard answer is because the church has it, but I can't say that now. And I said, well, because as a church, we've decided to take first Sundays and give them to our families, visit other churches, give our ministry teams a break, a chance to take a deep breath, let our leadership take vacations and do whatever we're going to do. So we meet the other three or four Sundays. And he said, I've never heard of that. I'm definitely coming. That's the healthiest thing. <laughs> That's the healthiest thing I've ever heard of. How much, what a blessing I would have missed if I had bowed up and asserted myself for what I thought I wanted. And, and the question I have for those of you who, who fit this category, like I said, I, the majority of you, you're very nice people and you seem very compliant. <laughs> But those of you who are struggling internally, those who are being spoken to by this, the question I have for you is this. What blessings of the Lord are you missing because you're resisting them? What blessings are you missing because you're resisting them? And as a guy who's walked this road, as a friend, as a pastor, I just want to tell you, Submission is the most beautiful, peaceful discipline that the Holy Spirit has taught me. It really is a place of incredible peace and beauty, and I crave that for followers of Christ. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for this really simple bedrock principle that God has established the authorities in your life. Help us to internalize this, to embrace it, to not just tolerate that, to celebrate it, to exploit it, to embrace it, to, uh, to claim it as a piece of our identity, um, that, we're, that we're going to express our trust in you by trusting the authorities that you have 
established. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would prevent the enemy from lying to people about this teaching, that, uh, Lord, if there's anybody that's in an oppressive or an abusive relationship, help them to, to not hear me saying that, that that's okay, that they need to stay there. That's not what this is about. We're not teaching uh, these nights on the exceptions to the rule. We're talking about the biblical principles. So, so, Lord, I just pray that the spirit of truth would dispel error, and especially the voice of the enemy as he tries to taunt people on this very touchy topic. And, Lord, if there's anyone either in this room or hearing this teaching remotely who is where I was those years ago, and they're made angry on the inside by this. They're frustrated. They don't even know exactly why. They, they, uh, they, they want to turn this off or punch the computer, or, and they don't even necessarily know what all string. I pray that you would open up the eyes of their understanding. Lord, would you be gentle with them and coax them uh, into a, a place with you where they can, they can open up and, and have the Holy Spirit reveal um, what, what, what has caused this to begin with? And uh, Lord, I pray that you bring us into a place of freedom in these principles of authority and submission. I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have a great night, everybody. Love you guys.